Hey what's up guys, today I'm going to be talking about geometry and patterns in nature. It was a presentation that I had to do in school and I thought it would be cool to share with you guys as well because I thought the research was pretty interesting and I thought you guys may like it. So here we are. Uh, why this topic? I'm an environmental science major. At school I've always had a love for earth, nature, animals, and everything like that uh, ever since I was young. I actually wanted to be an astronaut growing up as a kid for the longest time um, but then I literally grew out of it. I became too tall. Uh, to be an astronaut. There's actually a height limit of six foot four and once I reached that limit I was uh, pretty sure that I couldn't be an astronaut anymore and um, You know I, I kind of refocused here towards Earth obviously our own special planet and the things on Earth and I always loved um, Nature and all that good stuff and I've always noticed the patterns and crazy things that you can see everywhere you go um, on earth which is uh, interesting so that's why I chose this topic so geometry in organisms there's also or there's always a lot of symmetry in organisms in fact most organisms on earth show some kind of symmetry some do not however obviously sea, sponge, sea sponges are uh, the, the prime example sponges are notorious for their asymmetry they grow in weird wacky ways and they usually don't have any kind of symmetry but here's some general patterns um, of symmetry in nature obviously we have bilateral symmetry which is um, shown in humans it's when one plane can divide the organism into two mi mirror images so if you can imagine cutting a human in half right down the middle you'll have two identical halves now obviously we're we're not talking about specifically like internal organs and everything like that symmetrical because obviously our internal organs are laid out in such a way that makes us you know not symmetrical um, same with like uh, you know injuries or cuts bruises freckles birthmarks that kind of stuff just ignoring that and just focusing on the the simple body plan and the same with this um, butterfly the species of butterfly here uh, you also have radial symmetry which is when more than two planes divide the organism into equal parts so three planes here divide this coral polyp into uh, equal parts so that's interesting as well and we have pentaradial here the sea star is notorious for that the pentaradial symmetry is when five planes divide the organism evenly um, it, I kinda chose this one because this pentaradial layout of the sea star is actually very good for it. Um, it there's a specific reason why it has five limbs instead of like six or something so if you see here every like gap that's kind of close to the center of the organism here every space between the legs uh, if you can imagine trying to rip this sea star through that, you would have to eventually rip through one of the limbs on the other side. So wherever there's like a small gap, there's always a limb on the other side. Um, but if you can imagine it had six legs, so three on each side, um, you would actually have um, uh, two gaps closer, like closest to each other. So you could actually cut through the sea star very easily, and you know predators could get to it, rip it up very easily. So it's actually structurally better for the sea star to have five limbs and exhibit pentaradial symmetry. Um, spherical symmetry is when you can divide um, the organism equally with any plane as long as it runs through the center point of the organism. So it's perf it's a pretty much a perfect sphere and this is shown in the common microorganism found in freshwater ponds. This is the volvox. And now obviously we're, we're not talking about the sister colonies on the inside but if you can imagine cutting this um, with any plane as long as it runs through the center um, you know it'll be equal kind of like um, just you know earth a sphere so fractals here are also shown in nature Now, obviously they're not true fractals because they cannot exist in nature true fract fractals uh, because if you eventually zoom in far enough or go in far enough you'll um, eventually see the individual atoms of that um, thing but uh, fractals or approximate fractals I should say uh, can be found in nature and that's um, obviously seen here by the red cabbage you can see these ever repeating um, patterns here as you can you zoom out or you know you zoom in you can see very uh, repeating iterations of a single pattern which is very interesting and the same goes for this cauliflower uh, these little like mounds and they get smaller and smaller but if you look at the whole shape of the cauliflower it's just one giant of these mounds which is very interesting so that shows some fractal like patterns as well and the spiral aloe here it shows more of a spiral but it does have some fractal like patterns as well so ever repeating iterations of a single pattern can be found in nature so I did some of research on why uh, fractals um, naturally occur 
and there were some interesting ideas that um, I wanted to throw out there and just get you guys thinking about. So I wanted to see if maybe if there was some kind of evolutionary advantage uh, to having fractal-like patterns in your in your organism or whatever. Um, there was uh, an interesting idea that fractal serves as a means of compacting um, a species genome. So it could be like instead of having different DNA code for you know every part of the the leaf or some kind of uh, branch or something like that, the stem they they kind of compact their DNA code um, in a way that looks fractal to us, but to them it's it's actually saving them uh, DNA code or you know space. I, I, it doesn't really work like that. Genetics doesn't work like that, but it's an interesting idea uh, that less DNA will lead to less mutations, will lead to a higher survival rate. And here's an interesting quote from The Mathematics of Human Life by William Allman. Um, he says that DNA's fractal structure may represent a compromise between encoding the maximum amount of information while still being extremely resilient to damage. So that's kind of like what I was saying with the um, storing the maximum amount of information um, while also you know reducing your chance for mutation. Now I think this was talking more about DNA's uh, physical structure, but either way that's uh, an interesting idea. And Dr. Bruce Lipton also suggests uh, that fractals may be a, um, a means for maximizing surface area, which is also another interesting idea. So as you can imagine, if you're a plant, you would want to maximize the surface area of your leaf so you could expose as much as you can to the sunlight, which will increase photosynthesis and the energy that the plant um, will take in, and that will help the plant survive and everything like that. So here's the quote um, down here. At the level of the multicellular organism, the maximizing of cellular membrane space is achieved through fractal packing. So that's also another idea why fractals uh, could occur in nature. Uh, we also see uh, symmetry in snowflakes, which are really interesting because as you guys may know, no two snowflakes are ever alike. And there's there's been trillions and billions of snowflakes over time. Um, and it's believed that none of them show the same exact pattern because these things are so intricate. So how do they form? You, you first start out with a particle of dust or a small particular matter that's in the atmosphere. Um, that's pretty much where the water will cling onto. It's hard for water to form by itself in the atmosphere. It needs something to grab onto. So it will grab around this dust particle, keep building up, and as it freezes, uh, the different uh, temperatures and different you know uh, conditions that it is exposed to will, will um, cause unique shapes as it falls towards Earth. So I had a video here I'm going to um, plug in and you guys can see it's just a short video. I will leave credits to the original creator in the description of this video and you guys can check him out, subscribe and check out the original video as well. A snowflake starts as a dust grain floating in a cloud. Water vapor in the air sticks to the dust grain and the resulting droplet turns directly into ice. Crystal faces appear on the frozen droplet. Then a prism forms with six faces in a top and bottom. A cavity forms in each prism face because ice grows fastest near the edges. Faster growth on the corners causes six branches to sprout. The lines in each branch are due to ridges and grooves on the surface. These six branches form the corners of a hexagon, which occurs because the water molecules chemically bond into a hexagonal network. When the temperature cools to minus 13 Celsius, new growth at the branch tips narrows. At minus 14, side branches sprout on each branch. Suddenly, the crystal encounters a quick blast of warmer air, followed by cooler air, and more side branches sprout. The crystal gradually warms, making the tips long and narrow. The crystal encounters even warmer air, which slows the growth and widens the tips. Finally, this unique and delicate structure falls to the earth along with countless other snowflakes. So it's definitely interesting that snowflakes form that way. Um, and, you know, like I said, every snowflake is unique and it's it's really cool to just notice sometimes uh, patterns of snowflakes maybe on your window um, as you're driving or something like that. So uh, another pattern we also see in nature are spirals. Now, uh, spirals are shapes that wind in a gradually widening or tightening curve. Um, what's really interesting to me is that something as small as a snail who can be just a couple centimeters long shows a spiral in a shell but when we look out into deep space with our with our uh, biggest telescopes who can look billions and billions of light years away we see similar uh, spiral patterns in galaxies so I, I kinda wanted to see if there any deeper meaning um, 
you know, why are we seeing spirals on some some of the biggest scales and some of the smallest scales um, in nature? Is there any sort of connection? Um, but other than that, spirals are seen in the bighorn sheep here with their horns, uh, the infamous nautilus shell who also shows a golden ratio, and um, obviously the snail again. So uh, spirals again in nature we'll see the pine cone also exhibits a uh, double uh, spiral so you'll see as indicated by the separate um, colored lines and it's it, very interesting because if you actually count up the rows in pine cones you'll uh, notice that they're adjacent to the Fibonacci sequence which is just adding the two numbers um, of the sequence before it to get to the next number so um, if you actually count count up the rows of the pine cone they will be adjacent to uh, the Fibonacci sequence so there is some connection between a studied sequence a very infamous math sequence which you know has numbers um, to what we see in nature which is a crazy idea to me and the same thing goes for this uh, sunflower here if you count up the inner florets or the florets running clockwise and the florets running counterclockwise you also see that their numbers are adjacent to the Fibonacci sequence so 55 34 also are showed in there so why are these things that occur in nature such intricate shapes that show spirals why are they related to um, a mathematical sequence it's very interesting to me no one really knows why or if it says something deeper about our universe or nature in general but it definitely is interesting that that happens so as we can see here on the biggest scale we see a spiral galaxy which is amazing Meanders are shapes or curves that uh, wind or bend, so obviously rivers are the prime example here. Uh, a very dry piece of grand, uh, ground or a desert, and then a dry tree stump here also shows meandering. Um, why do things meander? So we have the river here. Uh, if you don't know how a river kind of gets its meandering shape as, you know, if you have a flowing body of water, it's going to be carrying some sand and dirt and uh, some other things. So if it, if it starts to curve, uh, even slightly, um, the stuff that it's carrying will be dropped on the inner bank and the outer bank of the curve will be bombarded with flowing water and eventually that's going to erode erode away and it, that will increase the curve. It's kind of a positive feedback loop and that's kind of how rivers get their curvy shape uh, through the ground, um, through the landscape. And snakes also kind of have a meandering body pattern. They kind of move in what's called lateral undulation and that's kind of contraction of their muscles in a certain way so that they can achieve movement but their scales um, which we'll see on the next slide um, help them actually grab onto things and propel themselves through their environment so their meandering shape ultimately helps them move around and get through their environment so lastly we have tessellations and tessellations are patterns made of identical shapes that fit together with no gaps and do not overlap the prime example is honeycomb made by bees these are very intricate patterns as you can see here with the hexagon uh, shape and it is believed that these hexagons um, or bees create hexagonal uh, honeycomb because it maximizes their nest space and minimizes the cell perimeter which is a very interesting idea and if you actually look into the geometry of a single one of these cells it's really cool because there's actually an angle uh, as you get towards the back of the cell that they they kind of build down uh, they build the cell down at an angle so that they can store a maximum amount of pollen and honey. And as we can see, tessellations on the back of a tortoise shell and the snake scales also show kind of a hexagonal pattern. So in conclusion, nature is beautiful. Go outside and appreciate it. Um, sometimes you can just walk through a forest or, you know, walk down the street and just kind of look at trees around you and just it's it's truly breathtaking at times. And sometimes it really gets to me really just uh, gets my mind going when I see some of these things in nature. So uh, again, just to reiterate, we see spirals in a snail shell that's 5 times 10 to the minus 2 or 5 centimeters across. Um, and then we see spirals in the Andromeda galaxy, which is uh, 2 times 10 to the 21st meters across. So such different scales in space, but such similar patterns, it's really, really breathtaking and interesting. So thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you later.